business capital, and political economy or impact. <coughs> First, let's start understanding what we mean by a wicked problem. So I went to Wikipedia to understand what a wicked problem is and here's what Wikipedia thinks a wicked problem is. Wikipedia says a wicked problem is a phrase originally used in social planning to describe a problem that is difficult or impossible to solve because of incomplete, contradictory and changing requirements that are often difficult to recognize. The term wicked is used to denote resistance to resolution other than evil, thankfully. Moreover, because of complex interdependencies, the effort to solve one aspect of a wicked problem may reveal or create other problems. Here are the aspects of a wicked problem. The problem is not understood until after the formulation of the solution. Wicked problems have no stopping rule. The problem never ends. Solutions to wicked problems are neither right or wrong. Every wicked problem is essentially novel and unique. Every solution to a wicked problem is a one-shot operation. You have one shot to solve it or not at all. And wicked problems have no given alternative solutions, which is important. Furthermore, there is another class of problems called super wicked problems, which is even worse than a wicked problem. And to add to these, super wicked problems have defining characteristics in addition to the ones that is listed. Time is running out, as in the case of global warming or climate change. There is no central authority who can make decisions. Those seeking to solve the problem are actively causing it. Right? A conference on climate change requires billions of people to fly to the conference, thereby exacerbating the problem of climate change. Policies that we have today discount the future irrationally. Right? So we have wicked problems and we have super wicked problems. So here's what we're going to do. We're going to explore a few aspects of the wicked problem. Hopefully today, by the end of this session, you'll be left with a better understanding of what a wicked problem is and how to solve the wicked problem. But how potentially you could be part of the solution. Here's what I promise. I'll take off the gloves. I'll have a no holds barred conversation with the panelists on stage. I've promised and threatened all of them that my questions are going to be aggressive. We let a few cats among the pigeons. While we're doing this, here's what we'd like you to do. Often when confronted with a wicked problem, we start off with what needs to be Right? We have a grand vision of what needs to be done. We need to live in harmony with nature. We need to reduce pollution. We need to prevent coastal cities and islands from sinking into the sea. So we should slow down global warming. But we can't. So we know what needs to be done. What we end up doing is, okay, so what can I do? I can take one less trip in my car. Maybe I can buy one less piece of plastic. But here's the problem with that. If anybody speaks to Dubai, there's a mall called the Mall of the Emirates. It's plus 40 degrees in Dubai. The Mall of the Emirates has a ski slope which is at minus 4 degrees inside the Mall of the Emirates. It's an actual ski slope with snow in the middle of Dubai. Here's what I think. You can switch off all the lights you want. You can use all the LED lights you want in your house. The amount of energy that that one single ski slope consumes will outweigh anything you do over your lifetime or 10 lifetimes. Right? So there's a dichotomy in what you can do versus what you must do. With that, it's time for opening remarks from each of the panelists. Each of you, I have one question for each of you. And you have one minute to try and answer the question. Anish Kumar, your first question. What makes a wicked problem so wicked? Not just wicked. I think in India we have uh, problems which are rigid also. This is a country which has uh, such huge number of uh, poor people. You count, you know, you get 660 million, you know, various estimates you can have. And if the country would have been the largest uh, country by themselves, you have the largest uh, workforce, educated workforce. Every year we produce 5 million graduates. Innovation, you know, this room is full of innovative you know, ideas. Why does this persist? You have a problem. You have uh, change makers, you have social makers. They coexist. That's one facet of the wicked problem that uh, I perceive. Shumita Ghosh, related to that, whose fault is it that the poor are so poor? Uh, I think you can't pinpoint one. I think the main, uh, the, the wickedest problem we face today, and which is why it remains wicked, is the huge inequality. And the inequalities that we see all around, whether it's between urban and rural, between 
intellectual quirk and one of the main <coughs> reasons for it is greed and endless greed. And uh, so, uh, so that's one reason why the world is so poor. Greed and endless greed. In Akshina, why should a country like the UK worry about whether India is developed or not? Why should you worry? Well, uh, the UK government has uh, committed a huge amount of its resources to alleviate poverty all over the world. So, it's the only major developed country to spend 0.7% of its uh, GDP on aid. Uh, we are worried about India because uh, it has 300 million poor people, larger than any other country. And uh, we feel that it's uh, got a huge amount of potential. So it can not only address its own poverty, but also contribute to poverty reduction in the rest of the world. So, for instance, we took the first Sankal summit to Africa earlier this year. Graham Lynch, your organization, the Legatum Institute, works on something called the Prosperity Index. Does prosperity bring about human happiness? No. There's certainly more to life than money. We all know that. So, but uh, clearly, prosperity is happening. Any questions speak into the mic? There is certainly more to life than money, we all know that. But intrinsic to human happiness and potential as well is a level of material happiness which they need to attain. And so what we want to do is create an institutional structure, a market order, which maximizes that potential. And I think one of the biggest barriers to posterity is actually a failure to recognize that political and economic freedom is intrinsic to that sector. That. And that political and economic freedom is not only an end in itself, but it also liberalises the potential of enterprise and business. And when we see business as development, and we say that we've got the economic and political freedom there as well, then you can also address that much more quickly and you can raise economic growth in the long term. Yes, there has to be a role for the government, there has to be. But that is really overcoming market failure, which is providing basic infrastructure, sanitation. It is overcoming environmental problems, where or as economists use it, or strange to externalities come in. But if you address those problems effectively through the state, but through a small state as well, which maximizes the potential of the private sector, then you can attain prosperity we would say contribute to human happiness much more effectively. Prosperity is a necessity but not sufficient <laughs> condition for human happiness. <laughs> Pretending to be one. Vivek Rai Gupta, what on earth is a Reliance Industries funded venture capitalist doing at a social business conference? Uh, thank you, Suresh, for putting me on that spot. Uh, I think it's for self preservation. Uh, I'll come at it from two simple things that we are doing. We are going at it for a carbon neutral economy. That's very important. I'm going to request you to speak to the mic. Okay. We are going at this problem from a carbon neutral economy. And it's in our interest to make sure that we can supply energy, but supply energy in a responsible manner. The second thing we are going at it is that we are trying to build an ecosystem in India for innovation. And if you look at developed economies, most of the growth comes from the innovation sector and small and medium enterprises. So we are spurring the growth of that, which in turn will spur up. So it's very much about driving change and innovation that benefits the whole ecosystem. So headline and self-interest at its best. Yes. All right. John Peter, USA, what is wrong with the aid process? Why, no, why doesn't the Indian government want aid anymore? Actually, I want to focus on what's right with the aid process. Uh, I think we're at the cusp of really uh, an enormous, enormously important revolution in terms of what's happening with development. Uh, official development agencies, regardless of the uptick in the UK budget for development and in the United States, we are increasingly a much smaller slice of the pie and a much uh, not, not quite the predominant actor that we were uh, 10, 20, 30 years ago. Uh, nearly 90% of flows to the developing world and to de uh, development issues now come from private capital. 
we'd be foolish uh, to not seize the opportunity created by that. And it's not just capital, it's not just resources, it's the expertise, it's the market knowledge, it's the groundbreaking technologies uh, that we have increasingly put at the center of our approach here in India. Because there may be uh, challenges that continue to exist here, but there are an awful lot of solutions that are being developed in India as well. Fair enough. Right, now we're going to get into the main crux of the discussion. But let me start with my next two friends. Samitha Ghosh and Anish Kumar, I'm going to come to your sequence sheet with the same question. Let's start with the problem of rural poverty. That's an area that both of you have been working with for over 15, over two decades almost. Samitha, so what makes it so hard? A group of poor people who can be trained, who can be given jobs, who can be turned into entrepreneurs, and be helped to pull themselves out of poverty. But why then does rural poverty persist for this many years? is, is uh, you know, a mindset problem at the beginning because uh, what I find is that, what we find is that a lot of people who, who are kind of resigned to where they are, to what their status is and having been used and have been used to receiving doles and grants and think that, you know, they can continue, that someone else will help them to get out of this, whether it's the state, whether it's NGOs, whether it's someone else. So I think that's one crucial reason why people often cannot think uh, to make that leap forward. Secondly is... This would cover the people who are potentially recipients of the goal. They are recipients, yes. Yeah. So it, it, it sort of uh, you know, uh, inculcates this mindset. And the second thing is related to my first answer is, is the question of greed and inequality. That very little resources get to people at the bottom. And whatever little, whether it's for investment in health, very little is invested in a girl who's born, whether it's on her health, whether it's on her education, whether it's on the skills she needs to become a productive citizen of the country. So, uh, and whatever little is there, again, it's cured. It's the, it, the preferences for the boys, so the girls get even less. And as a result of which this uh, spiral continues, I think these are the two main reasons. Okay. Anish Kumar, you worked with rural entrepreneurs for 20 years now, since the late 90s, and you work specifically in the area of poultry farming, if I'm right. I'm going to reference a point that Sumita made just now about greed. If you create hundreds of thousands of entrepreneurs in rural India, aren't you just taking greed away from the big corporations, away from the big cities, and giving the greed to rural entrepreneurs, but you get the same trick in economics. Now in the rural context, we have some rich poor people, some rich rural people, and lots of, lots of poor rural people. <laughs> I'll come back to this uh, tweet, you know, a little later. So our analysis as an organization is the biggest challenge in India we don't appreciate that no other country has caste. No other country has the indigenous population that India has. It has the largest indigenous population. And one favorite quiz I have with, you know, UMC segments like uh, sitting here is what's the population of the segment? Well, that's 100 million, more than the entire population of Japan. We don't realize it as a country. And that, you know, this segment is unable to receive public policy or market signals. So the capacity to aspire, capacity to dream, live that dream itself is a challenge. As an organization, today we work in, with one and a half million people, mostly tribal and Dalits, in 5,000 odd villages. We work, so one segment is this uh, promoting enterprises. But in these villages, we have various issues of food security, issues of gender violence, issues of uh, fixing the local governance. So when I look at this issue of greed, you know, if you take a communitarian view, greed is subsumed when you start looking at the community as a whole. And that's where we come to the enterprise that I worked in the last 16 years I was intensely involved with. The last 16 years, the enterprise that I was intensely involved with, it was about building a collective. And that's most of Quran's work is building social collectives, economic collectives. So the enterprise that I was involved with, poultry, works with uh, promoting poultry cooperatives. A group of 500, 600 women, tribal women, coming together and then creating a space for themselves in the market. So they can, you know, mutually support each other, learn from each other, and then they have that scale. You know, they have that uh, small fishes which come together and they become a big fish and they can take on a big fish. So you know, that's the analogy that uh, we build. The greed is moderated by the sense of collective. Right, so we have two unique uh, aspects to the problem. One is caste, 
and second is the feeling of the collective or the feeling of community and both those essentially what is what makes the problem both complex to solve and exciting to solve. Sure. Right. Pinakshi Nath, what makes for where you sit, what makes India's wicked problems so unique in themselves? I think alongside uh, caste and, uh, and uh, the community, the gender issue I would like to pick up. I think for a growing economy, uh, the labor participation of women is actually going down, which is uh, against all uh, global trends. Uh, I think that we have calculating household poverty and that hides female poverty. So if you were to separate out men and women, you will see a more dire situation than you do now. I think that women are still being socialized into believing they are far less confident, that they have less rights to health and education, and they don't assert. So while our constitution gives us those rights, actually we don't exercise them. Uh, I don't think that the, uh, the state has done its best, but I think we could have done a lot more to address the social inequalities in this country. And that makes the problem far more wicked. John Pink, same question to you. What makes, from where you sit, what makes India's problems so unique and so complex as compared to anywhere else in the world? Yeah, I, I think the, the scope, the scale, the diversity uh, of India really is, is uh, unsurpassed anywhere. Uh, and I think that adds an extra layer of complexity and uh, degree of difficulty, I think, to tackling any uh, problem. I think in most areas, you, you will find it has not been a function of a lack of resources. Let's take the example of nutrition, which despite some of the world's largest public uh, uh, subsidy programs directed at fighting uh, hunger and, and malnutrition, India's nutrition rates remain, uh, unfortunately, uh, all, all, all too high. Um, and yet, you see other areas of, of, of progress where a concerted effort, and going back to the combat about the importance of engaging the community, a concerted effort over a long period of time, not just the public sector, but the private sector, rooted in, at the community level, you had the, the remarkable achievement of polio eradication in India which not only had a tremendous impact here in the country, but all of a sudden, the world went from 40% uh, uh, polio-free to 80%. That really gives you a sense of the, <laughs> the scale and, and dimension of, of, of this country. The polio program is truly a spectacular success for India. During my Gupta, it's been said that nothing free is ever valued. You don't value it, you get it free. What is the problem then with grant money and aid money? It's essentially free money. Will it then tend to be undervalued and therefore pervert the very causes for which it's being deployed? Uh, my answer on that is uh, coming at it purely from a capitalist point of view, as well as the uh, intersection with social entrepreneurism. We think, uh, coming back a little bit to the last question you asked, I think if we just give grant money, we are not solving the problem, we are just putting a band-aid on the problem. What we need to do is, we need to encourage our workforce, our entrepreneurs to be able to strive to reach out and to be productive and create productive enterprises. And to the extent that we can facilitate having them that goal, that is where we should come. Just providing a band-aid is not a solution. We see that in all status, uh, we are right now going out to the market to hire uh, over one lakh people for rolling on a broadband. Uh, the goal we've taken is that in the process we're going to create over 10,000 entrepreneurs. We don't believe in giving our jobs. We want them to earn money by creating that. So that's the approach we take. I have a follow-up question. We've been always called a nation of entrepreneurs, a nation of small shopkeepers, a nation of small business people. If we're a nation of entrepreneurs, why is it so hard for this spirit of entrepreneurship to come from urban India to rural India? I think, let's look at what is the total output in India in terms of what entrepreneurism has achieved. Most of the entrepreneurism as you referred uh, today is at the retail level. So we are really not creating any value. We are just transferring goods from one source to the end consumer. 
If you look at entrepreneurism that creates value, you have to uh, often cite it. Look at the US economy. Look at how much of value is created. Two thirds of the value that is created in Silicon Valley gets absorbed by the large corporates. And that drives their growth. In India, we have only one fiftieth of that. And so, in our interest, we are trying to spur and develop that ecosystem of real product creation, real services, and not just trading man hours for lower wages for hiring. Grant Beach, from various reports that I read around the world, both America, Europe, and India, the rich are getting richer, the poor are getting poorer. Without 2008 and the labor crisis, we have been wake up call. It seems that in the intervening years, since 2008 and 2014, the rich, the 0.01% are getting even richer. And in India, it's rumored that 35 families control about 65% of the nation's wealth. My question is simple. What is the matter with governments and policy makers around the world? Why can't they see the writing on the wall? Well, can I answer that? But can I answer the previous question as well? Because I've got Clearly, all my previous questions seem more interesting than my current questions. So, yes. <laughs> because, quite simply, I, I, I can, if you look at the underlying reasons here, some of the core problems we're looking at, it's, it's, very, it's very clear to me that we can almost get to the place that India is the world's greatest democracy in terms of science. But there's almost a complacency there because political and economic freedom ultimately has to reside, not at the national level, has to reside at the and the people have to have the opportunities and the openings that that brings. And I think there's a real challenge here because you can look at the overall level and say, freedom. But then you look at the local level and are there property rights? Are there the freedoms there? Are there political freedoms at the local level? Are there the legal freedoms? Are there economic freedoms? Is there too much regulation? So whilst you may have political freedom, you've got to have economic freedom and economic potential at the individual level as well. Because otherwise you end up with one very simple thing. The unhidden hand is far more powerful than the original hand. Getting on to your question, sorry to be the politician. The unhidden hand or the hidden hand? The unhidden hand. The unhidden hand. Okay, that's all right. Brand new take on to that. I've never heard that before. <laughs> but, with regard to the question of we have to have the right attitude towards the creation of wealth. It has to be seen as a positive thing. But the reason you get the vast inequalities which become unacceptable in a political sense is because you don't have the economic freedoms so people can enter the market and take away the excess profits of some people. Competition deals with that problem. It's when you don't have competition that you create this sort of problem. I'll give you an example from the UK as well. This is not an India or a developing emerging markets critique. This is a developed and advanced economy critique as well. In the UK, we do we have a, a widening into distribution as well, and we used to see that as something positive. Um, it's somehow evolved, and now it's seen as somehow an opportunity. Not because we're creating wealth, but to take tax. So the top one percent of individuals in the UK now pay just under a third of all tax revenues on the income tax front. Now that is a problem as well, because we're bleeding a sector dry there potentially. The solution to this is very, very simple. It's economic freedom, it's, policy, it's property rights, it's the opportunity to get a piece of the action for yourself. That will do away. Now of course, if you've got institution and generation and familial structures which let that persist, You've got to deal with that as well. But again, that is an aspect of freedom. Freedom deals with this. The problem is we end up with a, a lack of freedom, which is a state-created problem. And then on top of that, you say, we're going to impose a state-created solution, which is even more taxation, which then undermines the incentives for wealth creation. We've got to step back and say freedom's the problem here. Minakshinath, you had a reaction to this. Yeah, uh, I, I tend to agree. I think in India what we've got is a few large corporates uh, because of historical reasons or crony capitalism who are doing really well and have huge resources. And then we have large majorities of self-employed, very marginalized micro-entrepreneurs. We have a missing middle problem, partly because of this reason. 
So it's not possible for people who have the potential to be entrepreneurs to just go out there and set up a business and use their innovation to drive and create wealth and to employ other people, which is why you don't have anything happening in the rural areas as you asked. So what we need is greater democratization of economic opportunities. And part of the reason is that it's true that the government has decided that its job is extending patronage and protecting those who are marginalized. And so you'll find, for instance, in agriculture, that there is a lot of subsidy, but there are lots of controls which were meant to protect agriculture, which are being totally counterproductive today, and actually preventing people from setting up those agro-processing plants or those industries that can actually drive farmer incomes up. So I think I do agree that India has huge amount of resources and what makes this problem particularly wicked is that if you have all this going for you, why can't you solve the problem? And I think both part wicked, of the reason is this. Both wicked and ironic. Now let's turn to some US bashing once again. John Bede, you've heard the arguments from the left of the panel. You live in a country that's arguably the freest, economically freest country in the world. You have high degree of economic freedom. You have intense competition, what Mr. Leach talked about, which should keep each other in check. And you have a great degree of political freedom. You have all three, the golden trifecta, as it were, in the US. And yet, too much wealth is concentrated in too few hands, and you have giant protests like the Occupy Wall Street or other such reactionary movements that say, why does the one person get so much? So, tell us from your experience of being an American, why does the one person get so much? Actually, we're, we're treading into some dangerous political territory here. Uh, I mean, from the U.S. perspective, not, not from being in India. It's okay, they won't do anything to you, don't worry. <laughs> um, you know, I, I would argue that the solution to economic growth and to uh, more inclusive uh, broad-based economic growth, the solution is not that complicated. I think there are enough examples around the world uh, in countries where by creating the conditions, the market conditions uh, for growth and for businesses to grow and to add jobs, coupled uh, with a laser-like focus on investing in the critical areas of competitiveness, uh, in particular health and education, you get a reduction in poverty, you get uh, inclusive growth. Um, there, there are a variety of examples like this around the world. In the United States, actually, you said we have one of the most. I, I think there are about a dozen com uh, countries that are more economically free uh, than, than we are, actually. So we actually have some room for I improvement. Uh, and there's actually a differentiation in the United States among states now in, in terms of the business climate and what is being done. And you see that, uh, you see that being manifested in terms of... Uh, uh, of inequalities or, or lack of job uh, concentration. So when you set the conditions right for business, I'm going to use the state of Texas as an example, which has made it very business friendly, and you invest heavily in education, which they have done. There's a huge public uh, endowment for education in the state. You create the conditions for more inclusive growth. Right, Ms. Leach, you had a reaction to to, to my spot of viewers bashing there. Yeah, I was, I was um, fired up by the, the nature of your question there. I, uh, this is one of these urban myths that the US is kind of zero state and it's maximized inequality as a result of that. As John said, it's, it, it's just not true. Um, yes, the size of the state on basic measures in the US is relatively small, but it's by no means the smallest. Um, South Korea is a lot smaller. It's not seen as some wild free market state economy. Australia is smaller. Um, but one of the key things here is don't look at crude headline measures. There's what I call the total intervention index, which is beyond tax and spend. It's including the regulatory and re legislative barriers to enterprise and growth as well. And there, the US is right up there. Maybe not as mu much as many economies, but it's up there. So, there's really no economy on the planet, really, which gives a, a clear example of how you can minimize the state to maximize enterprise and entrepreneurial development. It's an imperfect world out there. We all make the mistakes to one degree or another. All we do is apply them in a different local and national context 
based on our histories, but we all basically make the same mistake to a lesser or greater extent. Right, <clears throat> let me give, bring in Anish Kumar and Sumita Ghos at this point. You've heard what everybody else has had to say about market link solutions, about uh, the need for economic freedom, the need for political freedom, and for the two to go hand in hand to create true, lasting, and sustainable prosperity. What is the end game, Anish? What happens if everything that you plan for and everything that both of you are working for work incredibly well? We manage to lift rural, large parts of rural India out of poverty. We manage to make them wealthier than they are and wealthy in absolute terms. What is the end game? Will we end up with a society where a few rich people control a lot of wealth and a lot of poor people don't have too much or have a little? In, 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 in short, are we going to replicate the model of the Western world in India? Is that what we're aiming to do? I would uh, not hazard a guess there, but I was reflecting on my own experience. Thirty years back, I went to a village school and I managed to get into a, one of the best colleges in Delhi. Today, can a village youth aspire to do something like that? It's not just the inequality of uh, income. It is the inequality of opportunities that New India presents us. And it's uh, huge. Today, the Prime Minister, you know, he may be here for only a few days now, but he did say, the biggest problem is the left-wing extremism. 105 of our districts, out of 660 districts, are affected by that. And why is that? These are tribal populated East Central India. And that's uh, huge, 105. That would be you know, more than many countries put together. There the rate of the government doesn't run. The sense of alienation from the opportunities, because on one side you have a huge communication beam, boom, everyone has a TV or a mobile in their hand, they can see what the other Indians are, you know, what access to opportunities that they have. So they're yearning for change. But have you provided that opportunities? Go to the schools, you have surf Siksha Abhiyans, you have the National Rural Health Mission, your social infrastructure is crumbling. Why is that? So apart from the freedom bed, you know, we ask ourselves this question when we became free. From subjects, earlier of some Rajas of the British, we became citizens of a democratic country. Did we ever invest in building citizenship ground up? And this country today has, I mean, the reflection is very clearly we have failed to build citizenship bottom up. So you had 73rd, 74th amendment, which empowered communities to transform the, you know, the political economy around them. But you didn't provide them resources. So how do you build citizens who have a say, who have a way in terms of building a society which they can be part of? I mean, the Western model, you have, you have a 1.2 billion country. Can urbanization or the two-sector model solve that? Apart from the ecological disaster you have when all these people would come to cities and, you know, with the towers and the buildings, you just don't have opportunities. 8%, 10% growth also, where would rural Indians come? They would come as coolies. The capability metrics are very different. There was a recent study by LSE which you know, indicated the capability metrics doesn't exist for them to get into those jobs. They will be more disenchanted, more disgruntled. What will you do with? It is a social time bomb ticking. It is already showing in the left-wing extremist districts. I, and I, we have to fix the grassroots governance. We have to invest in citizenship building. We have to create opportunities right there. And thereby is the crux of the wicked problem. That's, and that's why it's I a, say it's, it's a a very wicked. Unfortunately, the wicked definition didn't had a handle on the Indian problem. It's very wretched also. Not only it is wicked, it is very wretched also. It's wicked and it's wretched. We can't agree on the problem. We can't agree on the solution. And most importantly, like Anish said, we can't agree on who should be the key stakeholder in solving the problem. Whose job is it to build better citizenry? Whose job is it to invest in citizenship? Shumita, I'm going to come to you with a question based on your experience working in the grassroots. We operate at a certain level of abstraction. We sit in a five-star here, we're under air-conditioned lights. Uh, John Bede works out of, I presume, a reasonably modest but fancy office. And so does Meenakshi Nath, so does Graham Leach. And so do agencies like the Rockefeller Foundation. We, in our infinite or finite wisdom, decide, let's root money, let's root entrepreneurship, let's root knowledge, let's root resources. Whether it's the government doing, uh, doing an NREGA allotment or it's somebody else doing a grant or an aid or any of that, what happens when all of this finally reaches ground? What happens? Are there any perverse effects? How do people on the ground see this so-called 
rain of money, a rain of knowledge from this abstract uh, stratosphere that we all seem to live in. What happens on ground? Yeah, I'd like to answer that in a different way, taking off from your question to Anish. Uh, I think, you know, I'm very positive. I'm very positive being on the ground. And one of the key things, and that's on the basis of my work experience over the last several years at Rangsutra, I need, a, a key to it is what I call economic citizenship. And where we have, uh, you know, with, by motivation of people who are really at the bottom of the pyramid, to get them to invest in their own development and growth. You think it's ridiculous, but it, ha it can happen. In the sense uh, that, uh, you know, when we started Rang Sutra, I'll just take two minutes to, to demonstrate what I'm, uh, you know, to, to elaborate what I'm saying. And that is when we started Rang Sutra, we realized that uh, we needed a lot of capital if we were going to be investing in product design, reaching out to markets, and uh, who has the money? And uh, so we, 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 we said initially, you know, on the basis of uh, similar to what Anish talked about, let's form a collective. So we formed a collective and um, we, got, we got people at the bottom of the pyramid, artisans and farmers who are really the poorest of the poor, socially and economically marginalized, to, to invest some money. Initially, they were very skeptic. The good thing was when they realized that there were, there were private investors, including one sitting here, Avishkar, and others, and the government willing to invest in this. So they said, hey, there must be something in this. So even if I cannot put in 5 lakhs or 5,000, I can put in 500 rupees. And that putting in 500 rupees or 1,000 rupees, whatever the capacity, in some cases as low as 200 rupees, in some cases women did not even have that much money. They had to borrow from their self-help group. But that gave, such a, gave them such a say in, in, in our growth that it gave them both a right to intervene as to how Rang Sutra was taking decisions regarding everything, because they are also, we have members on our board as well, members of, our, uh, representative of artisans, and uh, also, uh, uh, you know, uh, whom we were selling to, how we were selling, how we were costing. So that gave them a right and a responsibility to ensure that the company did well. So they, that, that change from being a recipient, a wage worker, to a worker owner, an owner and worker together, it, it, I won't say 100%, but... That could be the game changer, that could be it, the catalyst. It really catalyzed. And I think that's where I see the picture very different from what Anish is saying. I think that, you know, given the opportunity, people, people can, will invest, play a big role. And I think, you know, uh, up, further up the line, uh, if people, again, are willing to share more, are willing to take smaller margins, are willing to, uh, you know, cooperate, collaborate. It's a challenge for us to have different stakeholders on our board, right from the artisan to, to say, a retailer. But unless we listen to each other's problems and stories, it's, uh, you know. Yes, go, sorry, I'll just go to Anish Kumar and then I'll come to you. So, I think you got me wrong. I was saying if you invest in building capacities, ground up, this is possible. Today, across these villages, you know, last fiscal, through these collectives, the incremental output generated was 650 crores. Well, the enterprise that I'm involved with is 220 crore business. In the states of Madhya Pradesh and Jharkhand, they're the largest poultry enterprise, and they compete very competitively with the large players like VH Group or Sugna. It is possible if you build capacities at the individual level, build at capacities at the collective level, the individual agency, collective agency you focus on, it is possible to build it ground up. So I'm very hopeful, actually. All right, Meenakshinath, you have a counterpoint Building on that. Building on the hopeful uh, trend, I see many of these deprivations as solvable through business solutions. And that's what excites us. That's what brings us here. I think if you talk about deprivation on skills, you have skill trailing solutions. It's a business. It serves a need, it makes the poor employable, it gives them a job. If you talk about finance, there are microfinance solutions. It's a business opportunity as well as helping the poor get finance. We talked about farmers. We are investing, DFID is investing uh, through partners in a warehouse. 
this guy has two warehouses in Madhya Pradesh, he's going to take it to 11. I mean, we need to break our big problems down into small bits and solve them. 11 warehouses is great for Madhya Pradesh, which is two-thirds short of the storage capacity it needs in agriculture. If we can solve this problem, you will have less agri-waste. Those farmers are so excited to have a warehouse close to their farms because they find it very hard to take their small amounts of produce far away to store, so they end up selling it at whatever price they get. They are very excited that this guy is going to give them insurance, he's going to give them seeds, he's going to give them fertilizers because they find it very hard to hold the distant market to account and they feel they can hold this guy to account. There's a relationship building there, there's trust building there. If you talk about healthcare, we are investing in a healthcare chain which is going to give affordable healthcare. It's going to have standard procedures, it's going to have predictable good quality service which consumers can gain from. So I think every wicked problem has a potential solution. All right. Break the wicked problem down into components, attempt to solve them. Maybe you'll solve the macro problem. Okay. Now I'm going to change the tack of the conversation a little bit. I'm not going to do any more US bashing. Instead, we're going to do some corporate bashing now. Yes. Mr. Vivek Rai Gupta, you work for one of the, you're part of one of India's largest industrial conglomerates in the country. Why should a corporate like you be concerned with anything other than legally making profits? Why are society's concerns of any concern to you or society's problems of any concern to you? Two points of view on this thing. Uh, one point of view, again, staying with the theme that we said, self-preservation. Uh, for us to thrive or any corporation to thrive, we need consumers and we need consumers to have the consuming capacity. So it's in our interest that we live in a world and we live in an ecosystem which is healthy and thrives. So that leads to more GDP, leads to more growth and allows us to provide services and products. That's one thing. Second thing is that we don't live in isolation. We live and we need a healthy workforce for us to thrive and innovate. And so therefore it's in our interest that we live in a country which has educated workforce and a workforce that's healthy and full of new ideas that drive uh, growth. So but arguably you pay taxes, you pay corporate tax, it should be the government's job to create an ed educated workforce, a healthy workforce, not yours. Uh, I, I think uh, that's a debate between the government and, and what enterprises should do. Uh, I believe obviously that any dollar that goes into the government or any rupee that goes into the government, only 10 or 15 percent of actually sees any productive value. Okay. Compared to, we believe that we are far more efficient users and, and distributors of capital. Having said that, uh, the taxes are needed for obviously the utilities, defense, uh, public policy matters and, and the lower strata which uh, we all fundamentally believe needs to be supported. So, so we are not fighting the tax system, it's a tax debate whether are we using the taxes more efficiently, are we taxing it properly, it's, it's a different debate. But as far as uh, Taxes being a hindrance to creating an entrepreneurial environment in India? No. I, I think we, we have enough we can work with. I think uh, the issue is far more different. The issue is that we don't uh, have entrepreneurism in India, actually. I really challenge the view also, as I said earlier, about India is made up of entrepreneurs. I think we are made up of traders. We need to change our mindset and we need to work towards that. Go ahead. Move from traders to entrepreneurship. Graham, you had a reaction to what Mr. Gupta yes. was saying. I do apologize. I'm going to have a go at one of your questions again, or the assumption behind it. I think the assumption was that somehow corporate is bad, it's greedy, it's selfish. I mean... I didn't say any of those things. Frankly, I love corporates. I'm just saying. <laughs> but there was an assumption there. And this is the key problem. Corporate, if there is freedom, if there's free entry to markets, if there's a genuine competitive market structure, then Corporates will act in a self-interested way, but that is not necessarily selfish. We all act in a self-interested way to one degree or another. We don't run across the road in front of 400 cars because our self-interest says we'll get run over. That's not selfish, that's self-interest. And in the same way, if you have a real market structure, then corporates, large or small, will act in response to that and that market will create a, a solution to whatever, so if there's a market there, 
corporates will try and deliver a social solution or whatever solution it might be. And so I think we've got to get away from this sort of dichotomy between somehow corporate greed bad, you know, remember the 1980s, there was a film in the 1980s, Wall Street. And yeah, greed is good. Yeah, greed is good. That, as if that's what Adam Smith wrote in The Wealth of Nations, utter rubbish. Markets create a solution if you have genuine markets, and the means of delivering that is corporates, large or small. Right on that note, John Bead, how should we decide which of these problems should have market link solutions and which should not? For instance, solar lanterns is fine to have a market link solution, but private police offering protection to those who can pay is not. One area should be open to entrepreneurship and the other should not. How should we decide this and who should decide this? Yeah, I, I think that's, uh, that's a very interesting question. It's the crux uh, of the wicked it, problem. It's, um, but really, even if, if you look across the board at kind of all the development challenges or, or successes, they were not a function of either or, really. I mean, Al Gore didn't invent the internet. It was the research arm of the Defense Department that started it. And then, of course, uh, you know, the entrepreneurial talent and, and business community uh, exploded it. Um, Silicon Valley uh, wasn't uh, just generated by a couple of guys over a garage. I mean, that started with, with uh, investment from the government. It started with uh, the academic community working together and um, and uh, the business community we're, uh, working, and now it's being fueled by mainly Indian entrepreneurs, by the way. Um, Reverse colonization. We love it. <laughs> the polio example, which we mentioned earlier, that was a function of public-private uh, cooperation. Uh, the Green Revolution, which took India from a food insecure country to now one of the most significant agricultural producers in the world, was a function of public-private uh, collaboration. So. I don't think there is an ultimate decider or approver of who should do what. Um, I think it's important for both the public sector and the private sector to be engaged. To continuously engage and evolve a consensus solution. Arish, what if we have pressing needs? Not what if, we actually have them. We have a pressing need to deliver clean water to every single citizen in India. What if there's a complete absence of a profit motive? Should social business be allowed to venture into that space at all? Or should it be mandated? that this is a zone where no entrepreneurship is actually allowed. Clean water, for instance. I would uh, say, you know, um, enterprise uh, brings new ideas, new energy, and it, you know, solves problem in a more efficient and more effective way. Why not? You know, clean water, health, education. For all these sectors, you know, private sector could come in. And I would come, you know, there is a role for, when you talk of corporate and government, there's a role for society also. So, and in all these sectors, all these three, Sarkar, Bajar, Samaj, society, markets, and government have a role to play. And there will always be an interplay and it will evolve over a period of time. But we also have to ask ourselves these questions in this country. Is there a role for efficient public sector in delivering public goods like health, education or not? And why has it collapsed in the last 30 years? We see a real collapse of public institution in health and education. What we can do to restore that? And that's where I see a role for society. And by all means, you know, when we, we are in the business of creating wealth in the hands of poor people, we need partnerships with business. Whatever activities we have done without partnership with the business sector, in terms of technology, in terms of access to new markets, we would not have succeeded. By all means, we need the private sector in the villages of India to bring prosperity. Sumita, same question to you, but slightly, slight, slightly uh, turned around a little bit. Uh, is there a danger that opening up sectors like this to the private sector with a profit, irrespective of whether it's patient capital or impatient capital or conscientious profit, that there is a danger that we can turn public goods into private enterprises? And is there a philosophical problem in making profit Solving the problems of poor people? Uh, no, I don't think there's a problem in making profits. Uh, it's, it's how you've made the profit that's, it, that's important. Has the profit been made uh, again by greed at the top? Or, and how are you putting, investing back the profit? And uh, also, why not 
for example, what Anish said, you know, enterprise and entrepreneurial uh, private sector approach brings more uh, different ideas, different way of looking at the problem. I think uh, as long as, you know, everyone gets their due down the chain and up the chain. Who's to monitor that? That's why I said people stakeholders, people have to have a stake in whatever is being done. And a significant engagement with civil society, I And assume. a significant engagement with civil society, yeah. Right. The New Companies Act in India states that starting April 1st this year, a few days ago, companies with at least 5 crore net profit or 1,000 crore turnover or 500 crore net worth. I hope everybody knows what a crore is. A crore is 10 million rupees and a lakh is 100,000 rupees have to spend 2% of their average profits on what is called CSR or Corporate Social Responsibility. Vivek Rai Gupta, how is a company like yours equipped to understand what society's priorities should be and where you should spend your money? You have nothing to do with those problems. You are a business that's engaged in the manufacture and sale of goods or services and not in the business of running the country. Why would you be allowed to, why should you be asked to spend your profits on things that you arguably don't know much about? It's a wrong statement that we don't know much about the problems. I think we are very attuned to most of the problems because uh, we deal with farmers for our retail, uh, we deal with consumers in many of our industries, including uh, the people who use our gas and uh, fuel and other things. So we understand the country very well. We understand uh, what is happening to education, healthcare, agriculture, we, we understand most of the sectors. Perhaps uh, maybe a couple of sectors like defense and all, we don't understand that well. And as far as CSR is concerned, uh, it is ingrained an intrinsic part of what we do. Having said that, uh, I think the debate more for this forum is really how the 2% is spent by the corporates and how we can make sure that that goes much further than just spending the 2% as part of fulfilling our responsibility. And in that, we are continuously looking for entrepreneurs to be part of that so that we can set the agenda. We call it our money is non-profit, but we want to create profit for the entrepreneurs that use the two percent. That is where we want to focus our efforts on. And we are certainly doing that. Right, so here's a bit of gossip I heard yesterday in the, in the lobby. Post the announcement of the two percent, uh, the, the law that says two percent of your profits have to be spent on CSR, there's an increasing number of queries with people asking us, uh, is it a good time to enter the NGO business with lots of money entering? Is there money to be made in the NGO business? A quick study of India's NGOs will tell you that there are hundreds of AIDS control NGOs merely because it's a massively funded, highly glamorous, it has celebrities, it has Richard Gere, Parmeshwar Godrej, everybody has, has, has a finger in that pie. And less glamorous disease such as diarrhea, heart attack, which is the number one killer in India, and tuberculosis are much more dangerous. So Meenakshi, my question is for you. At a policy level or at a macro level, how do we ensure that the NGO, the social entrepreneur, the grant giver and the stakeholder are all aligned to the same cause and the same end result? One person wants to start an NGO because there's money to be made. One government says mandating 2% will, will force philanthropy or force charity. And somebody else says, let me start an AIDS control NGO because it sounds like a fun way to invite Richard Gere to India. There's no way we can stop people from trying to make money out of uh, these opportunities. I think the responsibility is amongst all of us to ensure that we provide the platform so that corporates can scrutinize and assess the possibilities properly before they actually put their money out. Organizations like us have had huge uh, you know, experience, we've worked with NGOs and what we are thinking is what we need to do is put that experience out, say, look, we've worked with these 150 NGOs, they're good at X, Y and Z, you please see what your corporate uh, you know, uh, uh, mindset is or what your aspirations are for that 1% or 2% and put your money out there. There are so many exciting solutions because the fact of the matter is that there are lots of people in this country who don't have resources and philanthropic resources are needed to address their needs. The state does have a lot of money but even that is not enough. So this resource is highly welcome and the challenge is to set up mechanisms to utilize it and we are quite engaged with that. All right, I'm almost at the end of this discussion. I'm going to uh, ask two final questions as closing remarks to all of our panelists. And after that, I'm going to open it up uh, for, to the audience for questions, so if we can get some mics in the audience in the meantime. Right, in conclusion to this discussion, uh, 
all, ladies and gentlemen, let's take one big super wicked problem and let's see what each of us have to say about. Let's take the problem of global warming and climate change. Here are the dimensions of the problem. A, we are not in agreement about what causes it. We are not in agreement about whether it's entirely a bad thing. We are not in agreement whether it's caused in part or whole by human activity. We are not in agreement with what we should do about it and whose responsibility it is in the first place to address it. Given these conditions, is any action in response to global warming ever going to be effective? I'm going to start with you, Sumita. What should we do about global warming? It's, a, it's an issue I'm sure that you have thought about, it's going to affect you, and you have a view on climate change. If you were in charge, what should we do? Well, I think uh, start with ourselves in whatever little way we can. Make personal changes. Personal changes. That's the only way I think all of we can address this problem. Anish, what would you do if you were in charge of the world? Let's say we put you the president of the world in charge of solving the global warming crisis. What do you think we should do? I'll, you know, begin with the micro. So, president of the world, I will leave uh, aside. You know, when I go to the villages, I see in the last uh, five, six years, there is a huge variability in rainfall. And farmers are terribly distressed. You can see in eastern India, and this year also, it is expected that there would be, you know, variety of uh, variability would happen. So I would ask this question, if the farmers have to deal with uh, climate change, they after all produce goods for all of us to survive. So what would it take? So I would look at climate adaptive technologies, introducing it uh, in the hands of uh, our farmer to make sense of uh, what this variability would do to them, to their lives, to their livelihoods, and you know, create uh, you know, sufficient uh, food, sufficient you know, nutrition for all of us to grow and thrive. Right, so start with the micro in both your cases. Yep. John, Beat, same question to you. If you were in charge, what should we do to tackle the challenge of global warming? What should we start doing tomorrow morning? You know, uh, I'm not just saying this because I work for the U.S. government, but I, I think what I would do is, some, is, is very uh, much along the lines of what President Obama has done, which is put it at the center of our uh, domestic agenda in, in terms of trying to support the uh, rapid uh, development and deployment of clean energy and, and renewables uh, and, and engage internationally with, uh, with like-minded uh, partners. And uh, I think that's been one of the most fruitful and, and most robust areas of bilateral engagement between India and the United States um, where there's been a lot of support and a, a lot of um, uh, development in terms of our work on clean energy uh, uh, research and deployment. Okay, so macro policy level changes at the clean energy and renewable energy level would be your solution. Graham, same question to you. At a policy level, what should we do about global warming? Or should we do anything at all about global warming? Oh dear, oh dear. if you thought I was controversial before. Um, I think I'd rewind the clock 25 years actually, and I'd say, what is the real scientific evidence here? Because what happened 25 years ago was an explosion of state intervention of funding in this area. It created a global industry within a very short time. And a global industry whose vested interest was in advancing the argument that it was real and it was anthropogenic, it was man-made, and it wasn't, didn't arise from national causes. And as a result of all that intervention, the counter-argument has never been effectively advanced or being had the opportunity to make its case. And that is a very, very powerful opposing scientific argument. There is. There are 20 to 30,000 scientists globally who've signed a petition questioning the fundamental basis of the anthropogenic case. And it may be that it's quite straightforward. I'm an economist, not a scientist, but I've read a lot of here, a lot, far too much. My wife gets cross with me how much I, I, I read about it. And it's quite simply that not direct solar variation, that can't explain it, but the indirect effects of solar variation may well explain virtually all of the science, all of the, the, the counter arguments to this anthropogenic case. So I would rewind 25 years, I would say, let's have a fair debate on this, because at the moment, because of a lack of freedom, the opposing story can't get into the market. It's one form of scientific hegemony when, when you never hear the counterpoint to global warming. Everybody's heard of the f a film called An Inconvenient Truth. 
Very few people have heard of a film called Apocalypse No by Lord Moncton of, of the UK, which is the counter film to global warming. So since there's a strong degree of political incorrectness associated with the view that global warming is not real or it's not anthropogenic, you don't hear that view. So here's a good illustration of a wicked problem and we can't agree on the problem itself. Right, Meenakshi, to you, what should we do about global warming? Yeah, I think uh, we have to create the incentives so that policy decisions or impact looks not just at one side, but also looks at not just climate change, but broader environment issues. So we should not celebrate green revolution without acknowledging that it had devastating impact on the groundwater levels in Punjab and Haryana. So there's air pollution, there's water. I think there are lots of issues and one-sided uh, analysis and one-sided policy decisions need to be avoided at all costs. Vivek Rai Gupta, there are two arguments to global warming, at least two, at least two arguments. One says we should invest time, money and energy in trying to understand the causes and slow it down or reverse it. There's another school of thought that says we should spend time, money and energy on learning how to live in a warmer world. If you were in charge, which way would you go and why? I want to start uh, from the beginning of your question in terms of the wicked problem and whether do we understand the genesis of this problem. I think there is overwhelming evidence that we understand the problem. We may not accept it. The problem started when we first invented the combustion engine more than 100 years ago and the way we changed our lifestyle at that time. Now, how fast will we take to reverse the 100 years of bad growth? We don't know. But what we are doing right now is we are finding, again, small fixes to try to reverse some of the bad things that we've done in the last 100 years, including increasing our population from less than a billion to seven billion in the last 100 years. And our world is only capable of sustaining over two and a half billion to three billion by most accounts. So we have to figure out how do we find some systematic ways to come to that natural balance. In the meantime, we are all, as energy producers and energy consumers, uh, trying to address problems in the ways we can. We have created several large forums where we are again using this forum as an example, trying to create social entrepreneurs. We're creating the ecosystem where entrepreneurs can set up. I'll give you a very simple example or two or three examples. We're doing that for the shipping industry. We've created a means where we can replace old legacy marine engines, again back to the problem of the bad combustion engine. Uh, we're doing that for buildings. We're doing that for transportation. So these are, again, small incremental fixes. We have much larger fundamental issues to tackle until we can get to a balanced And that, state. ladies and gentlemen, is how a wicked problem is understood and almost solved. Right, I'm going to go into the audience now. Uh, once again, my request to you, keep your questions short. Uh, to the point, please don't give us long speeches. We don't have the time. Yes, let's go start with the gentleman who put his hand up first in the far right. Just wait for a mic to come to you, sir, and then... Tell us what your question is. Hi. Uh, this question um, is to everybody sitting here, uh, especially Mr. Gupta. Uh, sir, don't you think CSR is a matter of wounds and cure? Any matter kind of, of wounds and cure. Wounds and cure. Wounds and cure. You know. um, social and uh, no, uh, corporates, any kind of you know, highly profit-making company would entail exploitation be it social, be it environmental, be it any kind of exploitation, okay? It cannot go away with, with it. Now, uh, we do 80% of, uh, you know, that, that harm, and then we, you know, give 10%. And then we name it CSR, and then, you know, be the good, good uh, you know, do-gooders. We recently saw Mrs. Ambani uh, on the television for the Uttarakhand floods. Now, uh, don't you think that uh, the perspective of CSR should not be, should change from being the do-gooders to a to a you know larger you know business environment because tomorrow's business is is probably you know coming from the social sector. Right. So, Mr. Gupta, once again, uh, being part of the corporate, you are going to get a lot of bashing. So, there you go. And answer that. Uh, first of all, I think uh, I believe fundamentally that productive capital lies where we have efficient and large pools of capital. So with large corporations, you at least have capital pools that can be deployed to solve large problems, such as what is happening in Uttarakhand, such as happening in agriculture, and even in many other things with healthcare. 
Uh, the issue is that, at least in India, we as the corporates are not able to see eye to eye in terms of pooling our interests and tackling the problems collectively. And so therefore the impact that we are making is far less than the impact that's needed to uh, deal with the magnitude of the problem at hand. Right. Uh, Mr. Sinha, can we, I'll, I'll, the mic will come to you next, don't worry. Uh, do I see any hands in the back? Yes, there's lots of hands. We'll come to you next. Mr. Sinha in front here. Can we have the mic here? Go ahead, sir. <laughs> yes, there are two Mr. Sinhas here. <laughs> yeah, my, this is Ravi Sinha. And uh, Anish very correctly put it that uh, rural India, poor India is unique India. It's a question not only to the panel but to all of us sitting in this, in this room. Are we addressing the wicked problem with a wicked solution called urban-centered mindset to solving rural solutions? And the genesis of the problem actually lies much deeper. We are educated in an urban-centered way. Our B schools are made for the larger corporates. Some of us come out of that, and I'm a victim, and I'm a learner in that space, from a corporate honcho to advising social sector, and I've learned and unlearned. Is that the core problem? And if that's so, then are we addressing the wicked solution the wrong way? I'm and going to I, ask uh, Vineet Rai to answer that absolutely, question. Absolutely, and I would love to have Vineet's answer to that. And one question on the CSR, which is a viewpoint, and I'm very scared on that. I don't know if all of you have seen that there's one clause which says if you don't know where to put your money, put it in the Prime Minister's Relief Fund. And if 90% or 80% of all money goes into that, then you know what's going to happen. So Vineet, uh, I'm going to ask direct that question to you. The lots of us are people like us who come from Metro India, wear suits and speak English, trying to solve the problems of people like them. How is this going to work? Uh, so frankly, I, I fortunately went to a forest first. I was born in a smaller town, went to a forest, hung on the trees for three and a half years. Then no, just because you're lucky, you can't show off to the rest yeah. of us. I was born in a city and I went to a jungle gym. What to do yeah. now? So, <laughs> so, so the, question, the question that I have been dealing with in the last 15 years of my own journey is that my solutions have been changing with my own learnings. Uh, when I was 29, I was very confident that I have all the solutions to all the problems. Uh, today I'm 42 and I'm actually least confident of everything that I'm doing. In fact, uh, I was an investor in, in uh, Shumita's uh, business and uh, we made money out of Shumita's business and now I actually will not invest in Shumita's business. So I invested in a business, created a company along with Shumita which actually has ownership from poor people but today, the way we have moved forward, this is not a company I will invest because I am seeking scale, something that Zia Khan talked about. The problem is we are so fascinated with the word scale, which comes from the urban-centric thought process, the belief that 100 million, 10 million, 20 million, these numbers have fascinated our mind so much that solutions are driven toward them instead of bothering about the individual who constitute that million. Microfinance in India is actually a classical problem. The problem was defined, how many million people will you go and lend? And all Indian entrepreneurs are smart, so they started lending to the same women multiple times to reach that million. But all of us, the urban-centric guys, didn't think the entrepreneur is that smart. We never realized the same women might get five times, seven times, ten times loan and counted differently by everybody else. I think the challenge remains complex. We don't have the answers right now. And maybe we are trying to learn and unlearn at the same time. So that's it. Sorry, before I go to the next question, uh, Meenakshi, you have… Yeah, I think the beauty of the entrepreneurial solution is that they will adjust their mindset and their offered solution in the face of reality. So if you are dealing with the poor as consumers or producers as workers, you will adjust your business model because that's the only way we, you can survive. On the other hand, if you are doing supply side solutions, either because you're the government or you're because you're an NGO, there's far less reason for you to adapt. Okay, I'm going to come to you. I'm going to go to a couple of hands in the back. Uh, yes, the lady in the far right and then I'll come to you, don't worry. I just don't want to be, be a frontist and be all, be biased towards the front of the hall. The lady in the far right, could you stand up? Yeah. 
Go ahead. Good morning, all. Uh, thank you, Mr. Venkat. And I'm going to ask you to speak into the mic. Uh, good morning, all. And uh, thank you, Mr. Venkat, and all the eminent panelists here for such an interactive and uh, interesting session. Um, unfortunately, my uh, question also goes out to Mr. Gupta, uh, without any kind of bashing coming in. Uh, Mr. Gupta, I wanted to know that, uh, you know, the kind of initiatives that you've mentioned, you're going beyond uh, philanthropy and traditional CSR, and you're moving more into strategic CSR. So, uh, what could be some of the business opportunities or challenges that you can foresee uh, in, at the operational level? I think your question was about uh, business opportunities. Uh, if you just take the last question on developing a carbon neutral economy, uh, we have lots of business opportunities in that area. Uh, I just mentioned one example, uh, we are looking for entrepreneurs uh, who want to take up the area of uh, retrofitting ships. Uh, we've created a vehicle whereby we can provide funding through global institutions. We've uh, we are providing the technology, we are looking for ship owners as well as people in that industry to come forward to be able to take ships which were and engines which were uh, uh, put in the market uh, 8 or 10 years ago and replace them with uh, newer technology which is saving about 30% fuel. Uh, we are doing the same thing uh, for creating more efficient buildings. Uh, we've now tied up with several technology providers who are able to save energy to the tune of 15 to 20 percent. So, such and such, uh, there are multiple examples that we can get into. And uh, our goal is to provide uh, the tools, the capital, uh, the know-how. But at the end of the day, the implementation or the execution of that must happen at the ground level. And that is where there is lots of opportunities for entrepreneurs to step in. Right. A question? Um, the lady, yeah. Can we get the mic there? You're next, you're next. Don't worry. I know you've been raising your hand for a while now. Last, we have two, time for two more questions, so she and you, and we will try to squeeze in another one. Yeah, go ahead. Hello. My question is for Mr. Bede. Um, as an American taxpayer, uh, the money that comes to India through USAID, uh, I have a great stake in it. Um, so my question is, uh, the aid from the U.S. is often used as a foreign policy tool and everything that USAID does comes with the label from the American people. So my question is, in good conscience, how can we be using aid as a foreign policy tool? Let's say, um, you know, there's a, a freezing of relations with India. You know, something happens and anti-Americans come into power or we, we test nuclear weapons for yeah, fun. Yeah, exactly. Or we arrest another diplomat. Um, <laughs> so, and something happens and the money is pulled. And that does great damage. How can we in good conscience say that we want to help with development when there's this uh, foreign policy caveat? Right, the question of the big bad US using aid as a foreign policy tool. I'm not sure if you're entirely uh, qualified to answer the question. Yeah, I, I, I think I might uh, take issue with the, the vast majority of U.S. assistance is from uh, the American taxpayer, and it really is put against achievement of global development uh, objectives, which here in India and around the world is really focused on improvements in the lives of those living at the so-called base of the pyramid. Um, and since you talked about hypotheticals, I, I, I Right now, I'd rather focus on the fact that we're in a very happy world of uh, very broad and robust relationships between the United States and India. All right, a future diplomat in the making. A final question, we have to go to him. He's been raising his hand for the last 10 minutes. Yes, yes, Graham. Forgive me, a slightly uh, silly comment right at the end. Um, whereabouts in India, uh, whereabouts in America were India proposing to test nuclear weapons? Where? Oh, if I tell you, if I tell you, I'll have to kill you. Yeah. Uh, final question. I'm sorry, we have no more time for questions. Yeah, you, the question is yours. The gentleman in the front, can we send the mic to him? Yeah. 
it was great listening to you guys and uh, uh, it was uh, almost enlightening. Can you speak into the mic please? Sure. Uh, we, we have been discussing, about, I have a lot of questions but I am going to ask only one in the interest of time. Uh, we have been talking about the wicket problems, the super wicket problems. My question is also about one such wicket problem and my question is not only to the panelists but the whole crowd here. We have a wicket problem here. If you look at my uh, right, there are a lot of plastic bottles here. Yep. On an average, everybody in a day uses four plastic bottles and we don't refill it. And in the, in the morning, somebody mentioned that we are 600 people here. If everyone can refill their bottles twice a day, we can save 1200 bottles a day which comes out to be two hundred and uh, two and a half thousand bottles in two days. Got it, but what's your question? My question is, I tried doing that yesterday but there's no provision for that and uh, I, I in fact wanted to ask all of the audience, do you think if we can save two and a half thousand bottles in two days, that will be a, a great impact? How many of you think that? All right. If we can make a provision today, you talked about, uh, you asked the question what we can do tomorrow morning. This is something that we can do today, right now. If we can make provision to refill these bottles, we are going to create a great impact in these two days. All right, question asked and answered. Okay, gentlemen, ladies of the panel, thank you very much. I'm sorry we are running over time. I am eating into the next session. Thank you. Thank you for your participation as a great audience. Thank you very much.